Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the seed. Uh, we have a very great speaker for you today, Scott Jurek, ultra runner and author of Eat and Run. <laughs> Applause, awesome, yes. So he is going to be speaking and then doing a book signing and taking some of your questions uh, there. And also I wanted to tell you guys, we have a VIP after party today. Uh, we're selling tickets at the raffle booth for $50. We have an hour open bar, uh, VIP goodie bag, all for $50 and all benefit to Farm Sanctuary. And also have really great raffle uh, sales going on over there. All proceeds go to Farm Sanctuary. And there we go, Scott Jurek, thank you so much. Right. Well, thank you for coming today. Um, let me just get a quick show of hands. Uh, how many have run an ultra marathon in the audience? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. No prerequisite required that you had to run an ultra marathon, and I ask that because I'm going to give you a little idea. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with what I do, a lot of you know I am a plant-based athlete. I've been performing in ultra marathons for almost 20 years now. And uh, I'll give you a little idea. I'm sorry, the slides are going to be a little small for those of you in the back. Um, but we're going to get into some nutrition concepts, how I fuel my body, as well as things that you can learn, um, whether you're somebody who's a, a new uh, athlete to any type of endurance sport, you don't have to be a runner, um, and how you can incorporate that into your own diet as well as into your own exercise goals. So a little bit about me. Um, by the way, this one's not working, right? I assume this, uh, just ask. So maybe I, I'll try to, I'll block this one because it's not going to work, I think, the whole time. So those of you who aren't familiar, I grew up in northern Minnesota. Um, I was, you know, basically I grew up on one of those dirt roads where your next neighbor um, who had any kids that you could play with was probably a few miles away. And I spent a lot of time in the gardens picking rocks, uh, pulling weeds. Uh, I spent a lot of time hunting and fishing. Uh, basically, I grew up... Minnesota redneck. So, sorry if anybody else grew up uh, like me, but it was, um, it was a fun life. And for the most part, um, I learned a lot from being out in the woods and spending time uh, with my brothers and sisters, spending time with my mother. Um, she was a home economics teacher. Did anybody take home ec in school? I don't even know if they teach it anymore, but uh, she was one of those uh, teachers who basically taught you how to cook and sew and do all the things uh, that... Uh, you know, are important, I think, to learn in life. And so we grew up uh, basically a lot of time in the kitchen um, cooking, you know, everything from pot roast to cookies. And it was a real uh, enjoyable experience for me. About the time that I was seven years old, she developed multiple sclerosis and the symptoms with that. Um, and this is a photo of her um, towards the end of her life. And she really taught me a lot about, you know, taking care of my body through health and nutrition but as she aged and as she developed more and more symptoms, her disease really hit home with me in terms of thinking more about what I was putting into my body on a nutritional daily basis. And I think that's key too, is any of you who've had an illness in the family, um, it, it hits home where you start to realize like, okay, I wanna see what I can do to improve my health long-term. For me, you know, I then became an ultra marathoner. Uh, a few years later, started getting into this crazy sport of running 50 mile races, eventually 100 mile races. And, you know, around that same time, I started thinking differently about my own diet and what I was putting into my body. And initially, it was for health. I didn't think I was going to become a faster ultra marathoner. I had no idea what it was going to do to my performance, my recovery. Um, and later, of course, it had a huge impact. But when I first started racing, it was all about putting in more miles. Um, this is a photo from the Western States 100, a race that I've won seven times in a row from 1999 to 2005. And each year it was all about how can I tweak my training, how can I tweak my nutrition to get the results that I wanted to year after year after year. Um, and by the way, if you've ever heard about the Western States 100, um, this is the best place to be on that whole course. <laughs> it's about mile 78 and you get to cross the American River basically fresh mountain snow water melt that's coming down the river. And typically the race, you can reach a, a te temperatures up to 105 degrees. And this is typically the hottest time of the day for the top competitors. Um, it traverses over the Sierra Mountains from Squaw Valley. 
climbs 18,000 feet, descends 23,000 feet, and you finish on the high school track in Auburn, and a picture of me finishing across that line for the first time in the daylight. Now, a lot of you might say, well, Scott, I have, you know, I've helped runners, or I've run across that finish line in the daytime. Usually, it's the next day. So for my, my goal was to get across that finish line in 15 hours, 36 minutes. Um, and to give you an idea of what kind of pace that is, that's nine minute, 22 second pace. And again, it's, it's not Central Park running or Prospect Park running. It's, again, 18,000 feet of climbing with uh, rocks and roots and technical trails. Another uh, event that I've, uh, I don't know, I'm, I've got to be mentally insane to try this one, but years, years ago I said, no way, I'd never do Badwater. Um, Badwater is a 135 mile race from the lowest point in the lower 48 and actually the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, um, Badwater Basin, 246 feet below sea level. It then finishes at the portal of Mount Whitney. It used to finish on the top of Mount Whitney, so the highest point in the lower 48. And you go across Death Valley and also um, another valley called Panamint Valley. And that valley is known for its scorching temperatures. Um, temperatures can reach 125 plus degrees during the heat of the day. Um, and at night, even in the dark, those of you who have read, eat, and run, um, I describe temperatures, you know, at 10 p.m., it's still well over 100 degrees and it's pitch black out. Um, you just don't get a whole lot of reprieve from the heat. Um, Typically, too, you shield yourself from the elements. So a lot of people are wondering, you know, why would you have all those clothes on? It's 125 degrees, you know, wouldn't you want to run naked? But you're actually trying to insulate yourself from the exposure to the hot sun rays, as well as the sun bouncing off the pavement. So super extreme conditions, probably one of the, uh, the most beautiful places I've run, but also um, one of the toughest foot races I've encountered. Um, anybody read Born to Run in the audience? Okay, we've got a bunch of you. Um, I was fortunate enough, um, basically, uh, about seven years ago, actually, now it's coming up to about eight years ago, uh, to go down to the Copper Canyon and run with the Taramata Indians. And it was one of my trips that I'd had on my list for a long time. I wanted to, to go down there and experience, you know, these people who live in their traditional ways, um, basically through hundreds and hundreds of years of transitions and changes that have occurred in the canyons down there, and they still maintain a running tradition throughout their uh, culture and throughout the tribes. I um, did a 50-mile race with those, and I won't ruin the story for any of those who haven't read Born to Run or my book, but it, it was one of those experiences. I went down there not to, you know, Chris McDougall talks about, well, Scott went down there to, like, race against the Taramar, and I really went down there to run with them and really learn from them and see what I could learn. They're also known to eat a mostly plant-based diet throughout much of uh, their existence. They've subsisted off of you know, corn and beans and um, some vegetables, but their staples are the foods that we should all be fueling our bodies with, I feel. Um, another, finally, another race that I competed in was the Spartathlon. Um, do we have any uh, Greeks in the audience? Got to have some out there, okay. The Spartathlon is an amazing race. It goes from Athens to Sparta, 152 miles, commemorates the run that Pheidippides ran, um, basically uh, 200 BC. Uh, he ran that distance to get a message to the Spartans. At the time, Athens was being attacked by the Persians, and so they used foot messengers to deliver messages. He ran the 152 miles, got to Sparta, and the Spartans actually said, sorry, we're having a big festival, can't help you out right now. He had to turn around and deliver the message back in Athens that he couldn't, uh, you know, we weren't getting reinforcements. But that, this race commemorates that legendary run. Fortunately, we only have to go to Sparta. We don't go both directions. We just get to do the one direction. But um, an amazing place. You know, you run through little villages. Um, the children come out on their bicycles, out on foot, chase you down, um, just, you know, cheering you on. The people are uh, amazing. And any of you know, you know, of course, Greek food is fantastic. So it's a... It's a great place if you're an ultramarathoner as well as vegan. Um, another race, too, the Ultra Trail Tour de Mont Blanc is one that I've gone over for five years. Um, I haven't had my best race there, but it basically circumnavigates Mont Blanc uh, over 106 miles, 33,000 feet of climbing and descending. Um, you basically go through three countries and um, finish up in Chamonix, so another test of endurance. And lastly, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is the, uh, the race called the Hard Rock 100. It's 
a hundred miles through the San Juans. If any of you have been to Telluride and some of the, the places in the southern, western part of Colorado, these mountains are known for their ruggedness. Um, this course has over 33,000 feet of climbing, but it's like you're doing it with a cocktail straw in your mouth because the altitude is so severe, you're at 12,000 feet for much of the race. Um, you climb a 14,000 foot peak, which is in this slide right here, um, and you finish in a small town called Silverton, um, and after all that, uh, you, like I said, you've climbed over 33,000 feet. It's a quite spectacular place to go and, and hike or run, depending upon what you want to do. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how I made that race a little bit harder. But the main reason I'm here today is to talk about fueling our bodies. And as I mentioned, you know, years ago when I first started ultramarathon running, um, I just kind of put whatever I wanted into my body. Um, I was one of those uh, individuals who went to McDonald's at least three, four times a week. Um, two McChicken sandwiches and a large order of fries was really my go-to meal. Um, you know, I, I used to think I ate healthfully, but um, it really wasn't that healthy. Um, but when I started thinking differently about diet and had a few individuals kind of, you know, twist my arm and get me thinking differently, I started thinking, okay, I'm doing all these crazy runs. I'm, you know, putting my body through the ringer, so to speak. And at the end of it, I want to come out without all these injuries, without all these diseases that I was seeing working in a hospital, seeing, you know, with my mother having multiple sclerosis, things that I wanted to avoid. So I read the book Mad Cowboy by Howard Lyman, as well as books by Dr. Andrew Weil, Spontaneous Healing. That's really what got me thinking differently about food and food more as performance fuel, high octane fuel that we put into our body. So the way I look at the body, and I know a lot of you like, Scott, why are you relating the human body to a race car? It's not very environmentally friendly. But um, I like to talk about, um, you know, we, our bodies are race cars. Now, we can put any type of fuel into that race car and it'll probably go down the road. Um, it might make it around, you know, the track several hundreds of times. But, you know, is it going to actually be better for the engine long term? And so when we think about our bodies and fueling it, um, I like to liken it to a race car. And would you put regular unleaded fuel into a race car or would you put high octane, high grade fuel? And that's really, you know, what we need to think about it. Now we know, like the race car, we can definitely get around the track. Um, we can survive if we, you know, even put unhealthy plant-based food. I mean, Mountain Dew and Twinkies is technically plant-based, right? Um, it'll keep you alive and it'll keep you running for a while, but will it maintain and sustain health long term? And that's really, I think, the message I want you to, all of you to leave today, those of you, whether you're plant-based or not, um, really think differently about the fuel you're putting into your body and really how can you put high octane fuel into it. So a couple of things, I think the benefits of a plant-based diet for me, um, one of the big things as an athlete, I started taking responsibility for my health. A lot of us, um, in modern society don't really, you know, we assume doctors and technology will keep us, you know, healthy and strong and alive for many years. But um, one big advantage, I think, of a plant-based diet for me was I started being more involved in my health, taking more responsibility. Secondly, I really was in it for the long term. Um, it's about longevity. I wasn't looking for a quick fix. A lot of athletes are looking for, you know, that magic bullet that's going to allow them to perform better and faster and stronger. And really, a plant-based diet is not going to, um, some of you have maybe had success stories where you start feeling better immediately. Um, but some of you have been noticing probably like, well, it, I didn't really notice a huge difference. And you have to really think about long term. What is it doing to your cholesterol levels? What is it doing to your heart health? You know. Um, avoiding things like diabetes. And for athletes, we don't usually think about that. We always just want to go faster. Now, there are benefits as an athlete um, and things that I noticed, but for me, it was really about what, what, what's, what's it going to be like 20, 30 years down the line? Um, I just didn't want to get my performances. I wanted to really think about it, um, you know, long term. How am I going to improve my health? And then, of course, the satisfaction. Any of you who cook your own meals know this, that when you put time and energy into your diet, you're definitely more satisfied. You feel mentally stronger because you know what you're putting into your body on a daily basis. And that's, as an athlete, I think that's a huge performance edge, knowing what goes into your body and being in control of that, I think can you know, really help when it comes to race day and you're on that starting line 
and everybody else has you know, performed and trained and you know, prepared their bodies similarly, having a little bit of an edge mentally can, can make a huge difference. Okay, um, do we have any paleo folks in the audience, by the way? Did they let them in? <laughs> of course, and there's some, this is why I bring this up, because I think sometimes in the whole um, athlete performance arena for diet right now, there's a lot of debate, and there always has been. Um, there's always new diets, and um, I like to embrace things such as, um, you know, I think we need to get along together and realize that there's benefits of a lot of diets. And so um, rather than um, kind of section ourselves off and not talk to individuals, but there's a, a great number of people too who maybe adopted a paleo plant-based type of diet too. So my basic, uh, what I want to say is basically there's a ton of diets out there. There can be a lot of confusion. And in the end, if you look at the diets that are successful, the things that people benefit from the most are usually they contain fruits and vegetables, whole plant foods. Now some of them, if you're paleo, you don't, typically incorporate grains and legumes, but if you look around um, at successful diets around the world, and if you look at traditionally what people ate, a lot of it's centered around legumes, fruits, and vegetables. And of course, some whole grains um, as we begin cultivating more. And if we look at around the world too, history tells us that some of the longest lived cultures and people typically have a lot of plant-based foods. Maybe they're not 100% plant-based, but a majority of their diet is centered around plant-based foods. And I think there's really something to be said with that. Um, they typically are whole, um, as much as possible organic, and then of course, very simple food. You don't need complex ingredients. Um, if you look at the way most of the world has lived, um, they typically have lived off of very few ingredients and very few in foods, not um, as much variety as we have today. We're pretty fortunate that we're allowed to have that. And then of course, um, a lot of plants. Now, I mentioned earlier I was going to talk a little bit about Hard Rock. Um, so the Hard Rock 100, um, I badly sprained my ankle. Um, you can see in this photo here. Basically, I, um, I've got black and blue running all the way up to my knee, if you can see in the very back. Um, I decided to play soccer with a bunch of six-year-olds uh, two days before the race. It was a YMCA DARE program. Um, not a good idea if you're doing Hard Rock. Um, badly sprained my ankle. Basically, it was the size of a grapefruit two days before the start. Um, I had been training year in basically for seven, eight months to get ready for that race. Trained a month down in Colorado. Um, basically put an air cast, a bunch of duct tape, and a couple of uh, other braces around my ankle. Ran it and set a new course record of 26 hours and eight minutes at that time. And I did it with zero ibuprofen, um, no anti-inflammatory drugs. Basically, um, sorry if you can't read this in the back, but basically turmeric, bromelain, arnica montana, ginger, vitamin C, and ice and compression. And that's all I did. Now, it, it hurts, of course. Everybody asks, well, did it cure it completely? No, it's not going to cure it completely. But my message here is that plants have a lot of power and healing attributes to them. Um, a lot of drugs will diminish some of the symptoms initially. You might notice less pain, but it actually prolongs the inflammatory cycle. So I think as an athlete or those who are active, we go through you know, periods of inflammatory um, high points and low points. Those of you who uh, might have a disease process going on or something affecting you, we go in and out of those inflammatory cycles. And I think it's key to, to start recognizing that plants really can be our medicine. I think Hippocrates said it best when he said, you know, let food be your medicine. And, you know, all of us can incorporate that, I think, into our daily life. Thinking of food, not just something that we get energy from, but rather something that heals our body, keeps our body running well. Okay. So everybody asks me, you know, Scott, how do you run these crazy 100-mile races, you know, through Death Valley, through, you know, high altitude, and basically keep your body running well? So I thought I'd kind of break my diet down. Um, those of you who want to get the Scott Jurek secrets, um, watch the next couple slides and go through what I'm going through here. So we'll, we'll basically keep it. My key thing and message in my diet has always been integration. Um, so many of us, when we try to go plant-based or change our diet, we really just think about elimination. So rather than think about the foods that you can't eat, think about the foods that you can incorporate. Um, it's very important because if you go somewhere to eat with your friends and you end up somewhere like a, at a steak joint, and if you just think about all the foods that you can't eat, you're pretty much left with maybe broccoli and potatoes, um, and that's about it. So, 
when you're thinking about your new diet, try to think about new foods that you can incorporate to replace the foods that you used to eat. I think it's really critical. Secondly, think of quantity. A lot of athletes and active people tell me, Scott, I tried to go vegan, I tried to go plant-based or even vegetarian, and I just didn't have the energy. Typically, what you're lacking in is not enough calories because you're just eating salad, um, which is great, it's healthy, but if you're trying to maintain your carbohydrate intake, if you're trying to maintain protein and fat, um, salad is not the only thing you're going to be able to eat or can maintain a, a healthy diet. And then thirdly, focus on quality. So after you've got the integration and after you've got the quantity, then you can start thinking about quality because there's a lot of amazing foods out there and sometimes people get bogged down in like, well, Scott, I'm not eating enough quinoa. I'm not eating enough goji berries. Um, really, it's, you know, focus on the quantity, then you can start getting into the quality. And I think that's the fun aspect of the diet. There's, there's so many foods out there. But first, make sure you're getting enough so your energy levels are staying high. Okay, um, those of you who have uh, seen me with big uh, plates of food, um, been known for my ability to put down a lot of food volume, well, that's because as an ultramarathoner, um, there may be days where I'm consuming 5,000 or more calories a day. Now, um, this is the part of the program that changes depending upon the sport that you're doing. So um, you don't have to follow Scott Jurek's plan unless you're doing ultra endurance events, unless you're doing um, bodybuilding where you're trying to put on a lot of lean muscle mass. Um, but as an ultra endurance athlete, calorie intake can be huge. So when it comes to consuming that, that's where it gets difficult. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, I can't just chow down on salads. Um, it means incorporating a higher fat content, which I'll get into next here. Um, Typically, too, I try to incorporate as much organic um, whole foods as possible. So usually when I'm traveling, it kind of varies, but 80 to 90% of that is organic, mostly whole foods because I love to cook and do a lot of meal preparation. And the key thing here, too, is I was one of those guys who said, why am I spending $5 a pound or you know, $6 a pound on some organic produce when I could be getting it cheaper? Um, it really took me a while to start thinking of it as health insurance and in making an investment in my health. And a lot of us, um, as we know from statistics today, spend you know, half the amount of money that we used to spend on food even just 25, 30 years ago. So I think you know, the investment of organic, the investment of whole you know, high quality fuel is really key. Um, and, if you, and if you can't do that initially, then try to eat you know, lower on the pesticide level. You know, foods, there's the dirty dozen. Try to avoid, the, avoid those foods that are really high in pesticide levels. But really think of it as cheap health insurance, first and foremost. Okay, so my diet's usually around 50 to 60% carbohydrate, because I know a lot of people think in terms of macronutrients. It's just what we've been indoctrinated with um, typical health and nutrition. So carbohydrates, I try to do as much whole grain as possible. Um, when I do bread, for instance, I do more sprouted breads. Um, try to avoid a lot of white flour. I think that's key as you're really looking at long-term health. Fruits and vegetables are a mainstay. Usually for breakfast, I might have two or three pieces of fruit. Um, it's a really key element, I think, in the morning to kind of get that blood glucose level up, incorporate some you know, sugars, but also incorporating that real fiber with it. Um, Legumes and whole grains, too. A lot of people don't realize that legumes, um, they're known, as, of course, as protein sources, but densely rich in carbohydrate. And for active folks, for those of you who want to get a nice slow burning, um, typically they're low glycemic. So you're not going to have those surges and spikes in your glycemic index and dropping at the end. So they really kind of help maintain a level plateau when it comes to incorporating those. Um, I do a little bit of pasta, it might be rice um, or whole grain pasta, but not as much. Okay, here's the big one, fat. Um, some people may look at this and say, Scott, 20 to 30% fat seems awfully high, especially if you look at, you know, McDougal and if you look at um, some of the, the folks out there, whether it's Esselstein. Um, if you have cardiovascular disease or you're treating, you know, high blood pressure, you're treating um, potential, you know, high-risk cardiovascular patients, definitely, you know, that is lower. But as an athlete and somebody who's active, and those of you who, you know, maybe have been low energy on a plant-based diet, you might consider bumping up the fat intake. The reason for that is the great thing about fat, it's nine, basically nine calories per gram. And I know in the U.S. we've been told for so many years, like, low fat, low fat. Well, fat's kind of coming back now, and I think it can be healthy if you're burning those calories. 
Um, as an athlete, it would be very hard for me just to eat bowls of pasta all day long because, of course, that just has four calories per gram. So um, for me, in trying to get 5,000 calories in a day, that's where I bump up the fat level, and I think a lot of folks would benefit from that if, of course, you're eating healthy fat. So the second part of, you know, boosting that up is eating healthy fats, things like olives, olive oil, almonds. Um, I do a fair amount of, like, nut butters. Um, I'm a big almond butter fan. Uh, things like avocados. Um, those of you who have been doing a little research know with essential fatty acids, it's a critical thing to incorporate. I'm usually doing that via seven sources these days. Um, used to use a lot of Udo's oil. Um, the great thing about seven sources is it has a plant-based EPA as well as DHA um, um, formula so that you don't have to worry about you know, avoiding or not getting enough DHA and EPA. Those are two things that are very hard to get and they come from algae in plants. So if you're a plant-based eater, look at your EPA and DHA levels. Um, that can be really key. Um, to a lesser degree, I do some sea, um, sesame oil. Um, I cook with coconut when I'm going to be using high heat. Um, some of you um, may have heard too, you probably don't want to crank up your olive oil. I used to use a lot of olive oil, but I typically now saute in coconut oil or coconut milk as much as possible, just because it's a more stable due to the being saturated fat. Okay, protein. This is where everybody is uh, confused and with athletes, they're always talking protein. Um, I just want to say here again, because you, you can't hear this enough, you can get plenty of protein on a plant-based diet. Um, whether you're doing endurance sports, ultra-endurance sports, power sports, sports where you're ripping down your muscles and having to build them back up. Now, you can't do it again if you're just eating salads all day long. Um, you know, you can be fine just kind of um, doing a normal diet, not high, low activity level, and eat, you know, low on the protein side. But if you're an athlete or somebody who's active, um, you need to really look at your protein levels. The way that I do it, um, I'm a big tofu and tempeh fan. Some of you might not be um, too into soy foods, but it can be, um, I think we've gotten too scared of soy. And cultures have been consuming soy for, you know, literally you know, thousands of years um, and utilizing that and incorporating that. So the key thing is avoid the really heavily processed soy products. Um, they're great for transitioning and they're great for, um, you know, once in a while, but I like to really stick with the tofu and the tempeh. Tempeh, by the way, if you don't like tofu, it's um, got a different texture. You should really give it a try. It's three grams of protein to one gram of fat. So if you want a really lean, high protein source, look at tempeh. I think it's a amazing uh, food that I usually incorporate at least two, three times a week. Um, whole grains, when you combine them with beans and, you know, legumes, you essentially can get the full range of amino acids. If you look at research too, you don't have to consume them in the same meal. Years ago, they used to say, okay, you got to get your, your legumes and your grains at the same time in order to make sure that you're complementing those proteins. Well, most of the research now says as long as you're consuming a variety of amino acids throughout the day, there's no issue with it. But the key is you want to get some from grains and some from beans and legumes. So just kind of mix that up throughout your day. Um, big smoothie fans out in the audience? Anybody in the audience? Smoothie fans? Okay. It's kind of the way I start my morning too to get a good amount of calories because I usually make a higher fat smoothie with a lot of um, fruit. But I also incorporate brown rice and pea protein. Um, there are a lot of protein powders out there. Um, I tend to just mix brown rice and pea protein, get them in bulk, larger amounts, and just complement them again with the amino acids, make sure I'm getting some grains, some beans. And that's kind of what I do. I do a little bit of hemp protein powder. Um, keep in mind, though, hemp is a little bit lower in protein relative to the bulk. So you got to use a lot of hemp to get a lot of protein. And then lastly, um, nuts and seeds. And they're lower on the totem pole when it comes to protein. So. Um, if you're going to consume nuts and seeds and thinking you're getting lots of protein, make sure you kind of um, adjust that because they're actually higher in fat, healthy fats typically, but um, just make sure that you're not doing too much uh, seeds and thinking, oh, I'm getting plenty of protein. Okay, supplements. Now, you can't see this photo, um, definitely not in the back, um, but it, it's an ultra, friend of, ultra running friend of mine, uh, Eric Clifton, and uh, he's been vegetarian, I think, for 35 years, and everybody asked me, Scott, should I use supplements? Do you use supplements? Well, he's got a, a plate. This is after a 50-mile run. He's got a piece of pizza, a bunch of potato chips, a bagel with whipped cream and Skittles on the top of it. And I think, yeah, there, there's a bagel with peanut butter and uh, M&Ms on the top of that. 
if you're going to eat like Eric, and I've seen him like devour a whole gallon of ice cream in one sitting, um, if you're going to be a vegetarian or plant-based eater like Eric, then um, I would strongly encourage you to take supplements um, because you're probably not getting enough micronutrients into your diet. But generally speaking, um, I incorporate very few um, supplements into my diet, and my whole belief is that you can get it from food. So um, the key thing here is looking at your B12 levels. Um, I do supplement with a B-complex vitamin um, quite frequently throughout my um, training season. If you're not doing a lot of fortified foods, B12 is something that most vegans and plant-based folks should be um, taking a look into. Also, um, to a lesser degree, iron, calcium, zinc, magnesium, these can be some micronutrients that you can be low in. Um, women more so than men when it comes to iron. I do take a liquid um, iron supplement because I'm training in Colorado where I'm at altitude. So a lot of times, um, you know, for much of the year, my red blood cells are being a little bit, um, you know, turned over at a higher rate. So I found kind of supplementing with a liquid iron that's easier on the stomach, not a real aggressive amount, um, has helped. But most men in general don't have to worry so much about the iron. We do, however, have to look at um, zinc and selenium. Those are two um, micronutrients you might, and minerals you might want to incorporate. I do um, just kind of an antioxidant blend just because I was a big fan of Dr. Andrew Weil's work um, when it first came out and he was all about vitamin C, selenium, beta carotene, and uh, to a lesser degree calcium. So I've just kind of kept that going. But again, it's more for the antioxidant effect. And I know that's in debate right now. Do we really need a lot of antioxidants? Should we be supplementing with them? Um, I've just kind of kept that going. I don't think it's harmful, but um, might be something that, again, you may, may not need to incorporate. And then probiotics is the last thing that I incorporate. These are basically, you know, your fermented foods. I, I'm a big fan of kimchi, sauerkrauts, um, miso, um, things like that where you're getting natural um, probiotics. Um, you can also do any type of coconut or soy yogurts that have probiotics in them. Or if you're not somebody who's as diligent on the, the food side, you might want to think about supplementing that with a, uh, a probiotic tablet or um, sublingual Okay, and then lastly, when it comes to uh, supplements, I always like to bring up super greens and superfoods because I feel like superfoods and, you know, basically microgreens, wheatgrass juice, barley grass juice, um, um, sprouts, things like that, those are great vitamin pills in their natural state. So young plants and sprouts, think of them really as like nature's supplements. There are ways that you can incorporate a lot of antioxidants, a lot of vitamins, minerals, micronutrients, phytonutrients, all the good things that we should be getting, um, but you don't have to take them in a pill. Incorporating those into your diet, I feel like, is way better than just taking a pill that has a bunch of uh, vitamins and minerals and micronutrients. Um, so I'm a big fan of those, along with that seaweed, too. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate, too, with iodine and incorporating that. If you're a big sea salt fan, um, you should probably be blending some seaweed into that because some sea salts can be um, basically non-existent in iodine. And we have a few minutes um, for questions, and we can take a list. I might actually put a couple slides. Um, well, you can't see them in the back, so I'll talk you through. I have a few slides if some folks have questions on um, basically race and training nutrition. So if we get a question or two about that, I might throw up some of these. I know it's going to be hard to see, but I have a few formulas because some people ask, you know, Scott, how much should I eat when I'm cycling, when I'm hiking, when I'm running? Um, and I've, I have a few slides. So if we don't have questions or if you want me to go over those, I'll go over those next. But I wanted to leave at least, um, we've got eight minutes for, for questions here. So I thought I'd open it up. And the way I like to do question and answer, um, so you guys are big Twitter fans right here in New York City. Okay. So um, please don't tell me your life story. Um, I want basically the questions. We're going to do lightning Q&A here. So you're going to have to keep your questions to Twitter length, okay? Those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's about, what, 165 characters? Characters, not words. Um, so I'm going to take um, some questions from the audience, and I'll just kind of maybe start on the left side and work my way through, and I'm going to answer them as quickly as possible. So um, I'm going to keep them to hopefully a sentence, um, maybe two sentences. So I'm going to try to rip through as many as possible because I know a lot of you have come. Yes? Okay, as a marathoner, how do I recommend training with all the gels and all the sugar? What should I be doing? Um, you know, here's what I say on that. When you're training and racing, your body is going to utilize that sugar, and you shouldn't be so concerned, okay? Because 
when you're out there exercising, your body says, hey, give me some of that glucose. I need it right now. Um, now, if you're going to be an ultra marathoner and running, say, day after day really long, I like to incorporate some real foods. I've been working with Cliff Bar for years, and I use, you know, the Cliff Shot gels, the Cliff drinks, very sugary stuff. But what I would recommend you do if you're going out there longer, you might want to incorporate some real food, bananas, potatoes, bean and rice burritos. Um, I'm a big fan of mixing it up. So um, short amounts, don't worry about it. If it's your two, three, four hour run, um, probably not a big deal. If you're doing that every day, um, you might want to consider something different. It's a good question. A lot of people have it. Uh, that was more than one sentence, but it's a good one. A lot of people ask. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Yes. Yes. So training for a triathlon. Um, I'm probably not the best qualified because I don't know how to swim. So first, learn how to swim. Um, <laughs> Uh, it makes your life a lot easier from what I heard, but at, at some point I'd like to give it a try. I would recommend for triathlon training, um, what, from what I've learned from ultra training, is that nutrition is really key. So I'm going to leave this slide up because for those of you who, um, for any type of ultra endurance event or, you know, whether it's half Ironman or Ironman or even marathon, um, half marathon, you should use this formula for figuring out how much carbohydrate to eat while you're training and racing, anything over an hour and a half. So um, I'll give it to you if you can write it down real quick. It's 0.7 times your body weight in kilograms. Okay, you'll have to do that conversion. It's a metric conversion. It's really easy. 2.2, um, you divide your pounds by 2.2. So it's 0.7 times your body weight in kilograms is how many grams of carbohydrate you should consume per hour. So grams of carbohydrate per hour. On the high end, it would be 1.0 times your body weight in kilograms. So whether you're, you know, ultra cycling, um, endurance running, you name it. If you're going longer than an hour and a half, two hours, um, some of you might not eat or drink much except until like two, two and a half hours, and that's fine. But in general, most people, when you start going beyond hour and a half, two hours, you will need to replace glucose, carbohydrate. And the reason for that is um, basically your glycogen will burn through at that point, and you'll need to consume some glucose or carbohydrate. So Again, um, you can do this on a plant-based diet. You do not need to eat a steak on the run or um, eat a pizza. Um, you want to focus on carbohydrates because that's what your body is really wanting to keep your endurance levels up, okay? You can incorporate fat and protein, but not. So the question on the triathlon side, you're going to be out there longer typically unless it's a sprint try. Um, so any sport long, this is probably my best recommendation is looking at your hydration and your nutrition to get through that event, because it's a very long event compared to what most people do. You spend a lot of time out there. So practice eating on the bike, practice eating on the, well, not so much on the swim. Uh, it gets a little tricky, but on the run especially, because um, that's the last leg of the triathlon. Another couple questions, yes? I'm sorry. Ah, so percentage of raw versus cooked, it's a good, oops, sorry, sorry about that. And so the question was, what percentage of my diet is raw versus cooked? Um, I tried the raw food diet completely for about six weeks, um, and I learned a ton from it. But most of my diet, I would say, is in the neighborhood of probably 30 40% raw, partly because I have to consume so many calories. Um, um, I really had to blend a lot when I was going on the raw diet, and it taught me a lot about combining foods, making foods I never had. And if it's dessert, I... Raw food is amazing for dessert, so I try to eat most of my desserts, raw food, but um, I'm not saying it can't be done. There's people who are doing it. Uh, Michael Arnstein, he actually, I think, was in New York. He lived up in uh, New York, uh, outside of New York City, up in Queens, and he was completely an ultra runner that was completely on. Um, he was a fruitarian, and so it can be done, but it gets very difficult. So my recommendation is eat as much as you are able to to maintain your calorie and your energy level up. Um, but I think the raw food diet is, is pretty fascinating. But there are times of the year, too, where I feel like the body um, kind of requests that we, especially the cold months, that we want a little bit of cooked food. So I think it's always finding that balance. But it's also body type, too. Some people do very well on it. Yes? So to help recover, and that, that'll be one more slide. You guys can write this one down. This is really key right here. This formula is how much carbohydrate and protein. So she asked the question, what do I do for recovery after working out? Now, 
anytime you're doing a strength workout, anytime you're doing anything longer than 90 minutes, use this formula. This is where protein comes into play. So I mentioned carbohydrate during the run and while doing exercise. Um, you don't need protein so much during that, but it's the recovery you do because protein helps basically build the glycogen stores back up in your muscles. And there's a time window. So remember this, the next time you do a hard workout, strength or endurance for longer than 90 minutes, you should be getting this within 20 to 30 minutes of exercising. So I'll give it to you quick. It's basically 1.5 times your body weight in kilograms. That's the grams of carbohydrate you should consume. And it's not just one energy bar. It's your energy bar, might be a banana, and then it might also be an energy drink. So it's more than what you think. Um, protein is 0.2 times your body weight in kilograms, and that's the grams of protein. So there is a reason that some of these protein bars have been coming out like 20 grams, 25 grams. It's for this recovery, and it's based on your body weight. So women, you know, 10, this is why they're getting more women-specific bars. Those are in the 10 gram to 15 gram range because they don't need as much as, you know, the 190 pound guy that's working out. So it's all based on weight. And again, protein and timing is really key for after the workout. Um, otherwise, too, things like ice baths, um, other things I do to recovery, um, I think, you know, massage, self-massage, foam rolling, all of those, um, some stretching, I'm big fan of strengthening, not obviously after a workout, but that helps prevent a lot of injuries too. But this is really key for glycogen replenishment. And I think I'm just about, I maybe I have one more time. Somebody tell me if I need to go, but I'll answer one more question, I think. I've got, yes. I'm sorry. Leg cramps, thanks. Yeah, you gotta do it the old fashioned way of transi transitioning it. So leg cramps, um, usually with leg, I'll give you two, two quick things. Basically leg cramps, muscle cramps can result um, from a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it can result due to fatigue. So um, sometimes it's because you didn't quite properly train. Now, some of you might decide to do New York City Marathon on a whim, nothing wrong with it. Um, just keep in mind, you might get cramps just because you haven't prepared those muscles to fire thousands upon thousands of times, if not millions of times, during that you know, four or five, six hour marathon that you decide to do on a whim. Um, now, so training helps that in avoiding the fatigue. The other thing is electrolytes, and there's a lot of debate on this. Um, there's a ton of information out now saying, well, you, you don't really need to consume sodium while doing exercise. You know, your body will regulate that. I'm a big fan of using sodium on the run. So um, I typically do anywhere from three to 400 milligrams of sodium. Um, it was a woman who asked that question. I would say for women, because typically, again, it's body weight dependent, you probably only need 200, maybe high-end 300 milligrams per hour. So what I would do is play with adding sodium and electrolytes into your regimen with fueling and hydrating. So rather than do, just drink straight water, if you're having issues with cramps, look at either using tablets or capsules of electrolytes and incorporating those, because sometimes people don't use the energy drink on the course because they're worried, well, I'm not used to it, I'm not gonna you know, use it in a race. You might bring your own, I, I highly recommend, I do capsules because I can regulate, in addition to the electrolyte drinks I'm doing, I can regulate it a little bit more. And then I can drink it with straight water and all the other you know, sport foods or real foods that I'm eating. So look at electrolyte, and you can get, there's a ton of them out there, salt sticks, succeed, um, and then maybe look at drinks that have higher amounts of electrolytes if you're somebody who's not going to do capsules or uh, tablets. But they're great and that's very helpful for the cramping. So I'm probably going to get booted off here. So I'm going to head back, um, sign some books. It's been great being here at The Seed. Um, great to be back in New York City. You guys are doing great stuff. Just the energy at events like this is just fantastic. So keep doing what you're doing and uh, thank you for having me.